of the Greenwich Board of Selectmen. Um, joining us via teleconference today is uh, Selectman Sandy Litback. Um, at this time, would you please rise and join in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So welcome, this is a public meeting. It's not a public hearing, although the chair reserves the right to call upon any interested attendee to uh, pose a question or make a brief statement on an item that's on the agenda today. There are copies of the meeting's agenda as you come in um, to my left. Um, and if you'd like to follow it, uh, you can obtain a copy of the agenda in the materials that we'll be reviewing today. Um, essentially on our agenda, there are two um, items under old business that we will be uh, continuing to review and potentially act on. The first is the annual review in uh, consideration of proposed parks and recreation fees. And then two is um, the readoption of the senior tax relief ordinance. This is um, an ordinance that's scheduled to sunset in June of this year of uh, next year, excuse me, next year, 2019. And then we have two items uh, related to property tax appeals um, that Attorney McLaughlin will review in executive session and we will consider acting upon in public session as well as um, a couple of interviews for boards and commissions that will occur um, in executive session and then potentially any action that occurs would be in public. So that that's the agenda today. Um, the second item on the agenda is to approve minutes from the December 6th regular board meeting and, and entertain any corrections, uh, adjustments, or w what have you for those minutes. Move the adoption. Okay, they've been moved by Mr. Toner. Is there a second? All right, thank you, Mr. Litback. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, uh, updates. Um, on December 7th, I was uh, part of a panel discussion with the PTA Council. Uh, this is a group made up of the presidents and representatives of the town's 15 public schools, um, 11 elementary, three middle, our flagship high school. Uh, the focus of the discussion, of course, was on the budget, and uh, joining me at that was uh, BET Chair Jill Oberlander, RTM Education Committee member or Chair Kimberly Blank, and Board of Education Chair Peter Bernstein, along with the professional staff of schools uh, school facilities and administration. Um, clearly there's a focus on um, the operating budget for which the Board of Ed has exclusivity and responsibility for. And with regard to the capital budget, um, the practice has been since 2004 for the first selectman to present a consolidated capital budget um, for the town and schools. I think the record would show under my tenure there's been very little, if any, adjustments made to those requests from the schools for capital, um, but we certainly evaluate them. Uh, so there was a very uh, productive discussion. We also had on that day, it was um, Pearl Harbor Day, a ceremony out front here with the Greenwich Veterans Council and the American Legion Post 29, uh, remembering that um, Day that lives in infamy. Uh, the ceremony's guest speaker was Greenwich native and retired Navy Captain Mark Turner. We thank Captain Turner for making himself available and his, for, for his poignant remarks. This week we held a public hearing on the um, draft of the 2019-20 Capital Improvement Program budget. Uh, this is, is primarily on the town side of the of the budget. The Board of Education is uh, continuing to deliberate over their operating and capital budget. I believe there's a meeting scheduled for tonight where they are likely to take action. Since um, 
we held the meeting there has been an adjustment made to their request over what the superintendent had initially um, earmarked in his budget if you look at his budget there's a figure there of an approximate 51 million dollars um, he's since adjusted that to 26 million um, and the board of ed will ultimately decide what goes forward there but we had um, a very good attendance at the hearing the other night I believe there were some 38 speakers um, just to give you a cursory review of the nature of those uh, speakers interests um, clearly the Northwest fire and EMS station was uh, uh, spoken about a number of speakers uh, reaffirmed their commitment uh, to seeing the town move forward with this as as we know the RTM voted overwhelmingly in September to seek um, our support once again along with the BETs. We also had a number of speakers who overall message was to exercise fiscal restraint as it relates to capital um, and that varied from district uh, two, five, seven, um, nine. Uh, those were the speakers that I took note of. We also had um, a considerable discussion about replacement of fields and fields in general. Um, the underlying issue uh, for folks is that they do not want to see uh, synthetic turf fields uh, in new locations within our community. Uh, there were a number of experts from uh, various uh, academia and uh, medical uh, organizations on hand to talk about the risks and exposure to people, particularly young people, to these surfaces. Um, and we were very thankful for their professional testimony. Uh, we also had a speaker in support of moving the Sound Beach Avenue bridge and rotary forward, um, Arlene Lamazo, uh, as well as folks who um, want to see a little bit more thought to that, and particularly projects in in and around the old Greenwich area, given the number of projects that have been accomplished or <laughs> completion in, in the, in the um, last several years. So again, there were 38 speakers um, that were particip participating, um, and those were the general topics. So Northwest EMS fire, overall fiscal restraint, fields, um, being non-synthetic and then there were some who spoke in favor of the budget as presented by town departments to OFS um, and there were those who um, also spoke about adding funds for uh, open space so that gives you a little rundown the next step in that process is uh, to continue to adjust or get response to uh, information that people commented on to see if we could further um, educate and enlighten the, the public and then to wait the, B, the BOE's uh, approval of their capital budget so that we have a total picture of the capital requests for 2019-20 uh, just by way of um, information the comptroller's office was kind enough um, to provide us an updated capital appropriation summary going back to 2005-2006 and when you take into consideration all of the funds not just the general fund so you would have the uh, parking and uh, in, incorporated in here as well there's been just about 700 million dollars in uh, capital that's been expended in those years. So that just gives some context. On uh, Monday, December 17th, um, we swore in a new parking appeals hearing officer, Molly Salibi. Um, this is an important role for the town and particularly for um, citizens is that the, cit the citizens themselves serve as the adjudicator of uh, tickets that are issued by parking services or the PD and Molly is a, a longtime Greenwich resident she serves on RTM district 8 
and um, when a when I approached her, she said she was interested. She's met with the staff, and um, she's looking forward to getting um, acclimated and serving in this volunteer capacity. We would welcome any and all others who would look to give back um, to volunteer for this. Um, it's very important and integral part of our current process uh, for um, administering uh, parking enforcement. Received um, a copy of an email from an Easton, Connecticut resident um, thanking the Greenwich Fire Department, particularly the North Street Station crew for their assistance during the November 15th snowstorm. And for those of us who were here and went through that, it was one of these initial seasonal storms where everyone seemed to be caught by surprise throughout the tri-state and metro area. But this, I want to read this because this someone took the time to write it. And it was addressed to Chief Szynski. I am writing to let you know how grateful I am to your team at Firehouse North Street, Whitney, Ed, and Tony. On November 15th, I left White Plains Airport around 4 p.m. to drive home to Easton and became caught in the snowstorm. The road conditions deteriorated very rapidly while I was on the Merritt Parkway, so I got off at North Street. I was afraid I would have an accident or worse, run out of gas, and become stranded on the Merritt for hours. At the exit, I turned right over the parkway, which took me past the North Street Firehouse. I made a U-turn and pulled into the parking lot. My plan was to wait in the parking lot and then head back to the Merritt to get home once the snow slowed. The snow continued and it was getting cold, so I went to the front door, knocked, and Ed answered. I asked him if I could come inside to take refuge from the snow. He was so kind and said, of course. Inside I met Whitney, who was also so welcoming. As the weather did not let up and the roads only became more treacherous, it was suggested I stay at the firehouse, and I was invited to join Whitney and Ed for dinner, which I did. I am so grateful for their kindness and caring in allowing me to stay in a safe, warm place. I am not sure where I could have ended up. I want you to know your team, Whitney, Ed, and Tony, went above and beyond their firehouse duties that night. P.S. I have a greater appreciation for our firemen and ladies since that night. While I was sleeping on the couch, there were three fire alarms. A busy evening for your team. Wishing you and your firemen and ladies a safe and happy holiday season. Most sincerely, uh, Janine Valentino Ridzek, Easton. You know, having read that, not only is it a testament to the folks <laughs> who serve in our emergency services, but I think it also reaffirms a point we're making about the need for Northwest Fire EMS because these facilities do not just serve as firehouses that just they put out fires. They respond to a plethora of different types of emergencies. Uh, I would categorize this as a humanitarian one, but again, I think it's somewhat of a um, poignant um, illustration of the value these facilities have. So again, thanks to that crew and, and to the fire services overall. Uh, finally, um, related to that, on January 7th, there will be a ceremony for Lieutenant Sean Morris, um, who is being promoted to the rank of Deputy Chief, and Firefighter George Latanzi, who will be promoted to the rank of Lieutenant uh, at the Fire Department, and that's on January 7th. That, okay, yes, that concludes my updates. Mr. Toner, you had something you wanted to say, too. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to make note of uh, something that I was invited to on Monday night. It was a court of honor for the Troop 9 uh, Boy Scouts, which are associated with the Second Congregational Church. They were celebrating their 100th anniversary, and it was a very nice affair. Senator Franz was there, as was Representative Bocino, and uh, the Scouts are to be commended with what they have achieved and what they're going to achieve. So. I was grateful to be invited. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Sandy? Do you have any? <coughs> Sandy? No, I don't. Okay. No. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's move right along. Let's move right along. Um, old business. Um, we had before us at our last meeting the proposed parks and rec fees. Um, <coughs> Joe, I do have a question or a comment on one item that was presented to me um, 
on Tuesday night, and that was a, a consideration. It was by Claire Kigel, and I believe she may have written to you. Um, her point to me was, would we defer increasing any of the fees related to Hamill until such time as a new rink is operational, given? In, in preparing this can document. You, can you turn on the mic, please? I'm sorry. Or speak into it. In, in preparing this document, the recreation superintendent and the rink manager looked at other rinks that uh, are surrounding us. Uh, and um, knowing that we haven't increased the, the general admission fee in three years, and we've had some additional expenses, um, the $10 fee that we're proposing for adults um, are, is well in line or more at the bottom sec uh, portion of what other rinks are charging, the more ones that have been updated or newer rinks. Um, we're just trying to you know, keep current on our fee schedule. I do understand her issue about having an older rink, but the expenses are still, you know, uh, cl you know, climbing, and and we do have, uh, you know, additional electricity and all the other expenses that go with handling rink salaries for the employees. This would not put us at the highest, at a, at a high point. It would put us at the lower end of the scale for competing rinks in our in our area. So um, that are more modernized. So. Um, as I said, we don't really raise the fee every year. We look at it, but uh, this would be the third year cycle, and our proposal is for $10. So that's the inf background information on the reason why uh, we are proposing to move it to that to that amount. Great. Okay. Um, any further comments or questions? Uh, there were a lot of people that sent notices regarding regarding that. I was to be on the record for a little. S Sandy. Okay, uh, I, just the general information response is that we're, you know, we're just trying to keep the fee schedule current, and we are on the low side of other, other rinks that have been uh, updated, and um, uh, it's strictly a board choice. I mean, I'm, I'm just bringing the fee schedule with the best information that I can to help you make your decision, so. Could you just comment briefly, Joe, on what's the timetable for uh, moving forward with improvements? Because I know that's been part of our... So currently there's been a committee working for almost <coughs> a year of uh, parks and recreation staff, uh, BET members and rink enthusiasts that look at... Uh, we have a RFP proposal out. Hi, Peter. I'm sorry. I somehow dropped off. So. Oh, no worries. No worries. But So I just was asking Joe to give us an update as to the process for moving forward with the improvements at Hamill. So he was just beginning to right. describe that. So can you hear him, by the way? Uh, I don't know. Start talking, Joe, and I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, okay. Can you hear me, Sandy? I hear you perfectly. Okay. Thank you. I'll talk loud and into the microphone. So... Um, the committee has been meeting for over a year. There's an RFP that's been put out for professional services to help develop um, kind of the initiatives that we, to do an evaluation of the current rink, which is not going to take much, but to do, to, to figure out the initiative that's going to go into the new rink facility. That is out on the street, I think this week, or will soon be after the first of the year. The committee will continue to work. There's a proposal in next year's budget to put $250,000 for the preliminary A&E work, uh, up to 30% of site plan approval by uh, planning and zoning. There's the additional money in the outer years to do the 100% of the design work. And then um, two years out, there's a proposed $5 million uh, be uh, placeholder in the 15-year in the plan to do the actual rink construction. So it's going to be a three-year project, uh, and, and our goal is to get that uh, in the works uh, starting July 1st after we have this evaluation done. Hey, Joe, do you do a what I'll call a P&L on each facility? So if I were to say to you, just take the rink, the revenue received, 
expenses? Do you do a P&L? Can you tell me how much money you're making or losing on that rank? Uh, I, I, it's 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 nothing we do as of a practice because the Munis system doesn't allow us to do it that way. But we could do it. It would take staff time to do it. And there's components in each budget. There's some in my budget. There's some in building maintenance budget. There's some in DPW's utility budget. So the the costs are spread in th several locations. Um, I mean, it could be done, but it's not a standard practice. And our financial application that we're currently working with does not do that automatically for us. Well, I understand that, but it seems to me, and I'm not being critical saying this, I don't mean to be personally critical in any way, that all we're saying is we don't know whether we're making money, losing money, how much our costs have gone up this year versus last year, how much our revenue has gone up this year versus last year. Uh, no, that, that's, not, uh, that's not exactly what we did. I mean, uh, the... I mean, the recreation the superintendent and the staff looks at, you know, the expense that we have. And, and, we, and I can guarantee you that we're not making a profit at the rink. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cost item for us. And, um, but, at the end of the, but at the end of the day, we're just not saying let's, you know, arbitrarily push it up to uh, $2. We look at the expense and we look at, and we look at um, what other competing, competing rinks are uh, out there doing. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, we're proposing this. You can propose something else or make a motion to keep it the same. I'm, but I'm saying there is a foundation. There is foundation for this, though. Well, it's a little bit. I, I, I would, I would beg the difference to say it's a little bit more than what we think, but, um, but again, you know, uh, you know, the the issue of profit and loss. Uh, you know, we're in the public recreation business, and and um, you know, it's been I've been the director for a long time, and you know, we've never really approached it from a profit and loss stand standpoint. It's a public service that we provide. Some programs that we have there don't make money, some are more of the revenue generators. Uh, I think on balance, uh, we're, we're in a, you know, as a town for providing skating rink services, we're in a good place, and I think we're at the lower end of the scale as far as the fee schedule that we charge. I, don't get me wrong, I am all for providing the services, and I'm not suggesting we should make a profit. I am only suggesting we don't know what this extra $2 does or it doesn't do for us. Other than saying, well, it's two dollars more a person, so we know it generates more revenue. Yeah, I mean, on that we know it's not. That's just not the way I'm used to making decisions. Okay. Peter, I'm going to move that we keep the current fee schedule in place at least for next year, and then let's see where we go from there. Okay. When we go, so what we do is we go through by code. So when we go through, if no one move, if no one moves it, it stays status quo. Okay. You know, we'll go through or like. You can propose a different thing. Right. Right. Okay. Um, do you have other questions? Yeah. Who pays for ex uh, increased expenses if the users don't pay it? The, the, the general tax. The taxpayer. Will do that. Yes. Thank you. So the the mill, you know, it just gets picked up in the mill rate. Yeah. Okay, Sandy, you had another question, so please go ahead. Yeah, I, I did. Could you could you tell me, please? What the, I'm um, looking at page three, what the, I, just my ignorance, what is the play group? It's a uh, children's, play, like a preschool, Sandy. Um, it, we have, uh, even though you, you think the fees have climbed there dramatically, we're adding additional time and service so that that's why the fee has gone up. Um, and and um, so that it's not just about raising the fee arbitrarily, it's, a provi it's about providing additional service to the um, to the to the play school itself. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. I, I, I was wondering, it, what, just curious, what is the additional service that you're providing? Well, the original service was, um, you know, we were providing a three or four or five day a week program. 
the hours were much shorter, so we're going to add additional time to that. So we have to have, you know, we're going to charge an additional fee to cover the expense of the additional time that you'll be able to, your child will be able to participate per day. Okay. Joe, just as a follow on to that, just where are those, where are those locations or is it just one location? One location. It's at the uh, Costco Community Center. Okay. And is, do you, this, this may not be in your bailiwick, but do you know if that's considered like a licensed preschool? It's a licensed preschool, yes it is. Okay. So just as, as a point of information, I'll just, oh, oh I'm just going to comment one more thing on that. Just as a point of information on that one, just having had kids in preschool, what, seven years ago? I have to think about this. It's a relatively good price considering what the marketplace charged. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it's, anyway, go ahead, Sandy, sorry. No, I was just going to ask what the Greenwich Adventures is. Excuse, excuse me, I, I missed that part, Sandy. Can you speak so What's the Greenwich Adventures? It's, it's an intermediate camp for, for like teenage children. Very popular. Um, it gives those kids that somewhere between the age of 12 and 15 an opportunity to participate in a program, much needed for a lot of the Greenwich parents who work. And um, it's a very, it's, it's grown, I mean, it started out this about four years ago, and the program's grown, and it's very, very popular. We sell out every session during the summer. Okay. I, I just noticed it was a 15%, roughly a 15% right. more increase. That just sounded like a lot. Is there a particular reason there, too? Um, you know, we tried to expand the program a little bit to accommodate a few more children. We have yes. a little bit more staff. You know, we, the, the children, these, 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 these teenagers are young people. You know, they, they go on, uh, uh, you know, they go on field trips. It's just all of that expense of busing and doing that kind of thing. Uh, it, but I, we are definitely in the market on, on, on this one. And, um, and we just did some fee adjustments just so that, not, not arbitrarily, just so that we can cover the, some of the cost of what we, uh, the expense of running this program and uh, the popularity of uh, having some increased uh, uh, participants. You. Okay, any others? Because we're going to go through them uh, code by code, so. Do you have, a, gentlemen, do you have any other? Or we'll start going through them code by code. I'm, I'm going to raise one more. I know this is just a bit. It's just one of these silly things that uh, bothers me in a lot of different contexts. And that's the photocopy. Really charging 50 cents each for a photocopy. Um, I know we're not raising it, but each. Probably cost us a penny. Yeah, we do. I mean, we, we get people who want to use their photocopy machine. I don't think it's an unreasonable standard among the whole building. Ours just happen to be more public than other people's. But, um, um, you know, we get people to come in and want to use our photocopy, you know. I mean, there are people who want to make multiple copies. It doesn't really happen that often. It's just in there as, a, as, a, as, a, as you know, people really want to use our system, then uh, they do pay for it, and they pay for it in other parts of the building, the same you know, same or maybe uh, same amount. So uh, um, it's just happened to be public in our fee schedule. Okay, so so we'll start on page one, I guess, right? Page one, and then so usually there's a motion second. If someone opposes the fee, they vote no, or you know, someone can move in second and. A majority can vote no, and then nothing happens, or they can change it. So those are just the options. So it's like status quo, uh, lower it, increase it, Absolutely. and then their votes on each each code so that the minutes reflect that. And Barbara, you're going to keep the record. That's how we've done it every year. So the first page is specific to the provisional beach policy. No change. And there's no change on this page, okay, from the current year. So basically, we're voting to approve something that's already in effect. Just to keep it current, yes. Okay, so we do need a motion for that. So moved. I will move. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Okay, moving to page two. This is uh, Organized Recreation 812. Do we do the whole thing? Well, yeah, 812 yeah, is all under the eight, Organized eight, Rec. Two, it's three pages. Page four. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, so four. that would be pages two, three, and four. And, and five. Five. Six. Pickleball, I know, is very popular. I was talking to someone about that. It's take, it's like the rage, I guess. I don't even know what it is, but it's... It's kind it, of like a tennis, but it's... Indoor court game. I guess I should learn it's more really, about it. It is really popular, especially among seniors. So the two pages two to six are eight, recreational, general recreation, eight twelve. Okay, so I'll give folks a chance to go through that a little bit if they want to just... So, so is the pickleball just at the Eastern Greenwich Civic Center? Uh, most of the time, yes, indoor. And we have some outdoor can, courts. Can I have a question, Peter, that sure. I should have asked uh, as part of it? Uh, so, on page uh, three, yes. under, my fa under my favorite top photocopy, there is administrative process fee for credit refund. What is that? So that if somebody comes in and decides that they want to, they've paid for a program, and they want to withdraw. I mean, we have a we have a process that we have to do in order to get them a refund. Um, and uh, this has been longstanding for probably before I became the director that there's a small administrative <laughs> fee to do that because we have to undo what we did and then get them a refund check and all that uh, that type of thing. Okay. Okay, so Sandy, if, so if we move, if it's moved, you could move to amend it if you have a, those specific things you don't want to vote. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we'll yeah. just. Okay, so we're gonna look at eight twelve. I'll just move it for action. Move it as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So it's been moved and second as presented. Are there any? Is there a motion to make any adjustments? If not, all in favor of as presented, 812? Aye. Aye. Abs Aye. Okay. Okay, 814 Eastern Greenwich Civic Center. And, and perhaps you can just, um, for public edification, Joe, go through what's the status of that building project. I know I just recently corrected a statement about that saying that the building's roof was leaking. In point of fact, it is not. The, bu the building's roof, ceiling, and lighting was replaced in the 2011-12 uh, fiscal year, and we just had a wonderful party uh, run by the Commission on Aging and Senior Center last week. And I happened to be looking up at the ceiling just to see <laughs> before that, but anyhow. So, so the status. And Mr. R Mr. Richmond's here. He was an, an he was another uh, guest w waiter there. The status of the Eastern Greenwich Civic Center building is that there is a staff and community and board of Parks and Recreation committee working on identifying the initiatives that go into that building. There was a study done and completed by SFA, which is a professional group to assist us with the. Uh, that determination of what uh, what the public really wants to see in that building. Um, we've held one, two, three, four, four, four committee meetings that are open to the public and published uh, in advance so that the public can come and speak at those meetings. Um, we will. We just had one last week. We continue to. We will invite a member of the SFA, the professional study group, up in January to speak to the committee and for the public to listen if they'd like. Um, I, I'm assuming that if, once we get through this process, there will be a some public information session of some sort so that the, uh, the committee can take comments from the general public. And we will start moving forward to start to identify those initiatives that we would like to see the new for the new design of the building. There is some money in the current TPW budget to do some of this initial A&E work. And, um, and uh, that has been there for a year. 
um, so that uh, as soon as we come up with this final report, then uh, we can turn it over to DPW. They can identify an, uh, an engineering and architectural firm that will do the preliminary design for the building. That's in general, that's, that's kind of where okay. we are. Okay, is there a motion on 814 Eastern Grand Civic Center? So moved. A second? This is 814. Five yes. Seconds. Yeah. Okay, second and okay. all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, 815 Community Centers. Joe, can you just. Um, these, these are just the two little community centers that we have uh, Yantorno and Pemberwick and. Um, Cascop Community Centers. It's just these are just some expenses that we have there, and um, it's very minor. I mean, um, not the expenses, but some of the fees we charge for use of the building. So, and there's only there's a, nothing that's being proposed to be raised. We are going to put in a security fee uh, for for a rental of the building, um, and there's an insurance that goes with the security fee for the use of alcohol in our building. So. I, I appreciate you highlighting that. Perhaps can you just tell us if you know, um, with that security deposit with alcohol, what type of um, insurance the renter has to have? It, the renter, if they're, use, if they're having alcohol at, at, the, at one of these two facilities, they have to provide the town not only with the general liability at two million, one million, they also have to provide a three million dollar alcohol endorsement. So that's for the insurance side of it. This is a security fee for, to make sure that they do that and also if there's any damages as a result of alcohol being used at one of our facilities. So. Um, it's a refundable. It's refundable. Understood. So, if, you know, it's cleared at the end. They get their two hundred dollars back, and everybody's made whole. So, great. Is there a motion on eight fifteen? So moved. I'll move. Okay. Second. It. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, moving to uh, Dorothy Hamill Rink, code eight sixteen. Is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved by Mr. Toner. Is there? Oh, okay, for purposes of, I'll, I'll second it. So now it's on as presented, but we'll entertain any adjustments, amendments. It, is the motion by John that you just seconded to um, adopt the fee proposed by the uh, by Joe? Cor correct, as presented, but you, we entertain an, we entertain a motion to uh, amend. Well, yeah, I, I'm going to move to uh, not increase the fee, but to keep it as it's level for at least one more year um, and see if we're making progress on getting a, a, a new improved uh, rink. I, I just think raising the fee uh, is not by, and I guess particularly because at least for me, and I know I'm new to this, and I understand Joe's point, I truly do, but there is no rationale other than the vague, well, cost of increase. I, we, we don't know how much they've increased. We don't know what. We think we're at the lower end, but uh, I, I accept that, but I'm not sure of that. Uh, I just think we owe it to people to keep the uh, fee where it is at $8 and $6, respectively. Okay, thank you. Is there a second to Mr. Litvek's motion? Okay, there's no second. Okay, so the item is now back before us as presented. We'll take a vote. All in favor of 816 as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Abstentions. So 210. Western Greenwich Civic Center, code 817. Again, you see the alcohol fee security here. Um, the, the rent is dic the, the increase in the rent for the, the children's day school there is uh, contractually uh, dictated. So uh, that's just the identifying it, and there's there really not any other uh, proposed increases here. Okay, is there a motion on eight seventeen? So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? One second. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Joe, just a second. Right. Is the damage security deposit what you're talking about when you talk about alcohol related? 
Yeah. Okay, uh, moving to 822, uh, page 11 of 19. This is for parks, playgrounds, and play fields. No proposed changes. There's no changes, okay. Is there a motion on this one? So moved. Okay, it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, moving to 12, page 12, Marine and Facility Operations, Beach Fees, 833. And that covers pages 12, page 13, 12 and 13. I just see a locker fee change. Is that for a year? Excuse me? That, is that for the season? For the season, yeah. A five dollars locker for sixty dollars and a full locker for a hundred. So five dollar increase in overnight camping just went up one dollar. Very minor changes here. Now it says here on page thirteen, cow barn area. Mm -hmm. That's going up twenty five dollars. But is the isn't the cow barn the Sue Baker Pavilion? No. Two different things. The cow, barns, the cow barn area is a picnic area up by the seaside gardens. Okay, all right. What was it? What was the other place called? Was it just called the old barn? The old barn. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting the old barn and the cow barn mixed up. I'm sorry. All right. I, I missed, I missed uh, the answer to the question on the locker fees. Is that for this, the year, the season? For the year. Uh, yeah, for the year. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, um, those are the only questions, there's two. Uh, so is there a motion to approve as presented? So moved. Is there a second? second. Okay, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, page 14, Marine and Facility Operations, 834. It's page 14, 15. 16. Just looking at Joe, can you can you explain on 834 45133 it says current fee $75 and then it says proposed $25 slash month. So what was happening is that we were, we, we were charging a $75 fee, a $75 flat fee. And it was kind of unfair to people who, you know, if they're, if they're 30 days late, they're paying a $75 fee. If they're six, 90 days late, they're paying the $75 fee. So what we decided to do is to break it down into months. So that if you're 30 days late, you pay $25. If you're 60 days late, you pay, six, you know, 50. you would pay $50 on and on uh, so forth. It just became more of an equality basis. People say, well, I was just late 10 days, I pay $75. But somebody's late two months, they're paying $75 for the penalty. So we did it in segments to be more equitable to people who uh, are more attentive to try to deal with their boat situation so it's it works up more f on a fair basis for the public and the people that are maybe running a little bit behind on on some of these uh and some you know on getting their boat go off or on the rack and that kind of thing so great so is there a motion on uh oh sure joe this does not include this, the fees that the um Commission on Aging, not the Commission on Aging, the uh, Harbor Management Commission. That's correct. They have yeah. to propose their own fee schedule to the board uh, for moorings. This, this has nothing to do with moorings. This is just docking facilities, racks, storage, lockers, those types of things. Their fee for moorings are, is a separate proposal. It should be brought forward by the commission. All right. Okay. So, so is there a motion as... Uh, so moved. So it's been moved by Mr. Toner. Is there a second? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, is this the last is the golf course? Uh, pages 17 through 19, it's code 824. I, 
believe, Joe, on page 18, you have a dollar increase to the Twilight Golf for members and guests. That's correct. And uh, we raised a little bit on the on our shotgun fees, and it's just a dollar on the level. Can you explain for folks who are not golfers what a shotgun is? A shotgun fee is where the, in, gen in general, it's where the, a group of people, and here you can see a minimum of 72 people in an organized group would take over the golf course for a certain portion of the day with a morning or afternoon session. So they're getting a complete block out and they're getting a greens fee at $51 for that per person for that group. So we're closing it to the general public and we have about 15 or so of these shotguns a year at the maximum 72 participants. And um, so it's an opportunity for them to get exclusive use of the course for their organization. And of course, they, uh, with that, they, they, we're blocking out anybody from the public. And this is the, this is the premium fee that they would pay to use that. So um, it's, 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 not, it's, you know, by private courses, it would be twice as much as that, or maybe three times as much as that. So we're a public course, and, and we're, we're in the market here. And uh, we're just trying to keep current on the schedule of, of fees, so we raised it a dollar. But it is a, it is a block, a complete block out. Great. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Joe, what is, just out of curiosity, what is the, the lease rental for the restaurant up there? Uh, the lease rent on for the restaurant is a five-year agreement. Uh, we are in the option years as we speak. And um, we have proposed to uh, not to exercise our option. So we're, that, that proposal is out to bid for, um, for the general public to look at and see if we can attract uh, other bidders. Great, thank you. Um, is there a motion to approve uh, Griff Harris Golf Course 824? So moved. Moved, by, moved in second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that concludes, I believe, the updates to the uh, recreational fees for 2019. Uh, thank you for your time. Peter, yes, sir. Before we totally leave that and move on to the next item, I, I do want to make a comment. I, I made it, obviously, in connection with the uh, Dorothy Hamill fee. But I think generally, going forward in the future, I am concerned uh, that we approve fees, whether they're increases or decreases or maintaining them the same, without what I think is proper information. These are town services. We want to make them available to people at the lowest possible cost, consistent with operating fiscally in a town map. But we really, we as selectmen, really thought that no information. Uh, we don't know, we're not told, and I don't mean that anyone hides it, but we don't have it before. What the revenue is, what the costs are, Joe says that some of the costs, at least with regard to Darby Hamill, I don't know if it's true with others, are dispersed through various departments so that he doesn't even necessarily have a handle on all the costs. I, I just think we are, and I use this word very, very loosely, arbitrarily deciding, okay, that sounds right. I'm, I just, that's not the way any business would do it. And I'm a little uncomfortable and I commend to the Board of Selectmen that as we look forward to future years, or as you look forward to future years, uh, this is information the Board should have. Okay, so I think going forward, I mean, what, what we do get, I mean, having done this a little bit, you look at more peer fee charges. What Mr. Litvak is saying is we're looking at what is the cost of each program and how do those costs reconcile with what we're charging so we know how much we're subsidizing or perhaps making. Um, I think that can be achieved with some work. It's going to require the finance department to work with you folks and... Yeah, we're going to require, I mean, there are software packages that do this. We don't have one. I mean, because so you'd be running, so manual. the golf course runs really as a, as a set aside. It's a revolving That's fund, correct. so you have it for that. I mean, you have your revenue that you take in correct. in your expense. The other programs are intertwined yeah. within the department, and so you'd have to really look at each 
activity and a program basis that's correct to be able to evaluate and provide the next year's board yep. with what it costs to run each program yep. in what if any money you're making or what you're subsidizing that's so right. I think it's a fair request I have no issue with it do you not really okay just keeping in mind that if you don't raise fees or if the users aren't paying their full share that the taxpayer has to pay that the general taxpayer let, let me be clear John I'm all for making sure that they pay the fair share and that we provide a service at the same time uh, but my point is we don't have the information now to know that we're doing that no and I can appreciate what you're saying wonderful well, wonderful we all agree <laughs> thank you for that uh, very valid and substantive point uh, the next item uh, on our agenda today is um, under old business is be readopt the senior tax relief ordinance um, this is coming to us um, through the Commission on Aging we have with us today our director Lori Contadino and the chairwoman of the board Patricia Burns as well as our assessor Lauren Elliott and our tax collector Howard Richmond um, each of these individuals play a role in this and um, we had it before us last meeting I believe there were questions about its application um, you've provided us some information of which we understand because it provides names and addresses is not public information but it gives us a semblance of how wide or how narrow this is being taken advantage of and I know Mr. Litvak you had several questions I believe for which I'm sure the team here will endeavor to answer so Lori why don't you start because you know and then Sandy feel free to jump in when Lori's done okay. so good morning um, in response to some in is that better so in response to some of the questions that you had the last time we were together um, one question related to the number of uh, perhaps income constrained um, individuals within the town of Greenwich and based on United Way's most recent data um, six percent of Greenwich households are below federal poverty level and 21 percent of Greenwich households are in that Alice category the asset limited income constrained employed what United Way does not have um, is an age stratification within that 20 percent of the population that um, is income deficient so that was uh, to the extent that I could find an answer to that question um, there's some information that um, as um, our first selectman mentioned that I provided that uh, has confidential and protected um, information because it has a uh, the names of individuals but the important thing is that there was a question raised about the um, the households themselves the value of the homes and the lowest net assessment um, receiving senior tax relief is ninety thousand seven four five and the highest um, is one million two eighty five so that gives you the high and the low there are 22 households that I'm sorry, Lori. Could yeah you, I don't need to know what what does that high and low represent the high and low of what of the value of the home seven percent oh, of people who are taking advantage of the credit Got correct it. correct and again we know that the income um, it's income based but there was a question about the value of the homes so 22 households um, are actually assessed at uh, 200,000 or below and 14 households are assessed at greater than 1 million um, for those that are receiving the the credit okay um, I did some quick math and just um, you know as a point of interest for me out of the 482 um, individuals um, that received a local benefit in 2017 306 are um, between the ages of 80 or over 80 and there actually are five individuals that are a hundred so that's about 64 percent of individuals that receive the credit that are 80 and older um, you know, 
the, our assessor, uh, Lauren, and I were, were trying to figure out the reason why our numbers trend downward. But if you consider that 64% are 80 and older, um, we lose individuals not only as they pass on to heaven or move out of the community, but perhaps into a nursing home. So that could attribute um, to some of those numbers trending downward. We, um, okay, except uh, <laughs> every day someone is getting into that category. Yes, yes, and that's the unfortunate reality. Um, Another element that we discussed uh, the last time we were together was a notice of the program that we could give to Greenwich taxpayers. So Laura, Lauren, Howard, and myself um, got together and, and approved a statement that would go out into the tax bill um, for your consideration. And um, Sandy, I'll, I'll just read that because I'm not certain if you have this before you. The Town of Greenwich offers property tax relief for senior residents 65 and older who meet annual income requirements. The filing period is February 1 through May 15 each year. For more information, contact the Assessor's Office in Town Hall at the Assessor's Telephone Number. Um, so that was another element that uh, we wanted to put for, before you for consideration. Um, Lauren can give you a little more information about how the state program um, works with the local program and um, how the calculation is derived. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren for some of those technical questions. And then um, any of the three of us are here to field any additional questions that you may have. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Um, for the last 30 years or so, the state has provided a tax relief program for seniors. And uh, the information that I'm going to give you also is, is what we received from last year, 2017, because we have not done, the uh, application period starts February 1st, so we don't know what's going to be in the, the um, parameters and haven't been set yet. They won't be set until I actually create the grand list. But um, the state has always, for the last 30 years or so, has provided a tax relief for seniors. And currently the benefit there runs from $150 to $1,250, as long as the income does not exceed $43,900. Now the town of Greenwich has implemented a local benefit, which is basically mirrors what the uh, state does. The only difference is, is that we expand the amount of people who are eligible by expanding the, um, the qualifying income. So instead of $43,900 being the qualifying income, last year the town um, allowed people who had income of $66,000 or less to get the benefit. But in addition to what the state applies, that, that $150 to $1,250, the town then grants anywhere from $620 to an additional $2,350, depending upon where your income falls. Um, last year, we had 274 seniors that qualified for the state program, and we had 516 seniors that qualified for your local program. Um, the total amount of revenue that we uh, got reimbursed from the state for the state portion was $149,624. The amount of credits that the town granted to, uh, based on your local senior program was $755,754. So the local program, sorry, no question? The local program actually just adds on to what this, uh, the state program does and provides additional tax relief for those seniors that are 65 years and older. Okay, has anybody had? Is it, is it correct, correct that um, anyone who qualifies for the state program would necessarily qualify for the local program? Yes, anybody who qualifies for the state program automatically, because the income limit is lower, automatically uh, gets the local program. There are people who don't qualify for the local uh, for the state program uh, that do qualify for the local. Because they make more than forty three thousand nine hundred. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know whether you're the person to ask or not, but let me just ask it. Someone can answer it. How do we determine the the uh, the amount? The state does forty three thousand nine hundred. 
we have a uh, schedule here that has a breakdown from 26 to 32, 32 to 39, and so on and so forth, up to 66. How do we determine either A, those breakdowns, and B, why is 66,000? How do we decide that that's the maximum? In your local ordinance, um, it's about, I don't know, uh, six pages. It specifically states how we are to drive the, uh, the amount of income that we allow. And it's based upon, um, there's an assessment limit, which is 150% of all the properties that have sold in the prior year. And then your income is based upon this, uh, it, it's based upon the CPI uh, that from the previous year. So that once I get those values in January, I then figure out your income levels. You started this program back in 2009 or 10 or so, and from that we've been basically Okay. 2000. Okay. Um, and basically from that point on, we have just been increasing the income based upon the uh, cost of living increases, COLA. And, um, hmm? and that's how we get up to, that's how we are up to the $66,000 right now. Okay. And when we started, we started whatever number we started. I, I don't care what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and we increased by COLA every year. Is that practice? specified in the charter, in the it's, ordinance, it's, where, where is that? It's in your ordinance. It's in the ordinance. The ordinance is very specific as to how we calculate the, uh, the maximum assessed value as well as the income and what income is qualified, what qualifies as income or not. It's all very, right. it's, all, it's all in the local ordinance. And, and that specifies the starting point too, presumably? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We also had this question come up, I believe, last time. A gentleman, I've, I've, re I've spoken with him prior to this, but he read that the ordinance is up for review and asks it once again. And that relates to um, individuals with disability who fall below the age. The state program allows for people who are 100% disabled to qualify as though they were, uh, in other words, if they are on social security disability, they can also apply and qualify for this senior program. That's on the state level. You do not have that written into your ordinance here. But the state does require that you be 100% disabled and that your income still falls below the levels that are stated for the senior program. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to. So can, I, can I also clarify, Peter, just again? The, um, are we being asked to approve in any way the proposed RTM resolution, which extends the code uh, until 2029? Is that what we're being asked in the first instance? Lori's going to answer that. Yes, um, you are. So we are requesting that um, the extension be a 10-year extension um, and that we not sunset every five years. And I know that there was some discussion about that the last time we were together. Um, but that is another element that you would be considering. And the third is the revised grid that we proposed that would have um, more levels. And that was out of a recommendation from the RTM um, Legislative Committee. So there's three different elements okay. that we're putting forward. So can you just go through again, one, two, three, what those are, just Absolutely. for edification, particularly for my good friend here, Mr. Borsak, who probably has it down more clearly than we do, but. Uh, don't assume. Okay. <laughs> so the first um, that we're requesting is an extension of the expiration date, so we Currently, will sunset in June of uh, 2019, and we're requesting a 10-year extension. Um, the second is that uh, we get approval to give notice to of this program to Greenwich taxpayers, and the third is that the income grid for credit be modified to include um, additional levels, but always you know working within that 66,000 max. Um, 
and so forth. Okay, and then I, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Sandy. <clears throat> I, I was gonna ask two, two questions. One is, how did you, you, you've added, if I'm correct, four different categories of, of breakouts. You previously had three, you now seem to have seven. Um, how did you determine the amount, the breaks in the categories and the amount to be attributed to each category? Our um, commission board member, Kip Bergweger, um, worked on this component of, of the grid, and I believe that uh, he spread the incomes um, within, let's see, they're about $5,000 um, apart, the income, the new qualifying guidelines, um, and that would enable, for example, someone that might not qualify for that higher level, um, they might get a little bit less or a little bit more. Um, it actually will give us the ability to give, um, we believe, a little bit more credit to more individuals, uh, depending upon where they fall. Um, but that was how he approached it, just trying to split each of the income levels and the credit, just trying to come up with uh, something that, uh, for you to review. I don't think that there was anything scientific about uh, his approach, just what he felt was a yeah. fair break. Yeah, I'm just looking at it, and, you know, in one category, there's a $12,000 spread, and in another category, there's a $4,000 spread, and the third category, is a seven, so it's all over the place, is what I'm saying. So, your statement that there was no particular uh, yeah. mathematical decision is, of course, correct. Uh, there doesn't seem yeah. to be any. Yeah. Um, okay. If, and I'm just, again, I'm just asking this for information. Right. If we thought, I think, uh, that the qualifying income level ought to be high. In other words, it ought to be seventy thousand. I'm making that up. Right. Is that something that we would have to deal with if we wanted to, in connection with this resolution or this proposal? Yes, it would be. We can do that. So, so Sandy, we. <clears throat> pardon me. We can do that. We could amend. The, the proposal and then the amended action would go to the RT mm -hmm. well the BET actually the BET is right. going to take this up as well correct correct so then they would be responding to it in that regard mm -hmm. do we have any sense Lori or anybody how the $66,000 income level the sixty-six that you're proposing at the max relates to the income in in Greenwich? No, I, I, I do not know. In other words, what I'm asking is, the state is taking 43900 and decided that's the maximum, uh, and, and that may or may not be a good number, so to speak, statewide. But I'm wondering how Greenwich relates into that, whether somebody living in, I don't know where, Easton or Brantford, uh, is that the same kind of level that someone in Greenwich is? Uh, when we're talking about people who make 70000 in Greenwich, they may be needing a credit far more than someone who's making 40000 or 43000 in uh, Brantford. Yes, I, I understand your point, but, uh, but I don't believe that, uh, you yeah, it, know, it's not, I don't believe don't it's believe formulated that, that, that way, that, no, okay. no. Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to think that I think it is the case. I have no idea. Yeah, no, I'm not sure either. It's a good question, though. I, again, I, I, and I know I sound like a broken record, and so I apologize. I'm just concerned that we do this without all the information that we could have or should have. Um, you know, this looks right to me, but I also have a feeling that says, we're just increasing by CPI, and for much of the time period you're talking about, there basically was no CPI increase. It was so minimal as to be unrealistic. That has nothing to do with living in Greenwich, in many cases. If I can clarify it, I believe the, the ordinance on page four set, originally set your income levels in the property tax credit. And then, in addition, it gives me, it gives you the, the assessor the authority to raise those based on, I'm sorry, not on CPI, but on COLA, the cost of living. Still, that, that's not a great deal. Where, where, are you, where are you looking? I'm on the, the local ordinance. OK. 
Okay, it actually sets out the qualifying when it sets out the qualifying e income parameters. This is your local order. So if you wanted to change that, you have to go. You're going to have to change it through a local ordinance. And then it also that's the basis from which all of this started. And then it tells me how to increase it each year. And your original property tax credit, whatever, I don't know exactly the, the data, the ordinance I'm looking at, your, your initial property tax credit was $500, and your, the highest that you could get was $1,900. At that time, the income levels went up to $60,000. So if you wanted to change that, you would have to change it. I believe you'd have to change it in this grid here, in this local ordinance, from which to, and that's where you would start. Yeah, that was the question I was asking. Yeah. Is there anyone who has any comment? Mr. Berg, would you like to comment? Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Peter. Um, my name is Peter Berg. I'm an RTM member. Uh, I'm both a supporter and critic of this program. Uh, and have been since I served on the BET in 2004, which is 15 years ago. Put the mic. Speak more into the microphone, please. How about now? Better. Okay. So I said I was a, I've been both a critic and a supporter of this program uh, since I served on the BET 15 years ago. I am a, I'm a supporter because I understand the goal of wanting to allow a senior, particularly one who has lived in town for many years, to remain uh, in a home. Uh, but I'm also a supporter because it, it answers the budget hawks on the RTM Budget Overview Committee uh, and elsewhere who uh, say that we can't increase our mill rate because, because low-income seniors can't afford to, to uh, the increase in taxes. Um, the, uh, those uh, denied budget increases um, deny our, all of our residents the higher quality of life that would, that would be promised in uh, the programs and the projects that are not funded. I'm a cr uh, I have been a critic of both the income limits and the credit amounts, uh, which seem meager. This year, the, the credit was $619 uh, for incomes of $55,001 up to the maximum of $65,000. So $619 is, I don't know, maybe 10% of the typical tax bill of a qualifying uh, homeowner. Uh, it just doesn't seem uh, very large, and it actually leaves us open to those budget critics uh, if they say um, that, the, that the seniors can't afford the tax increases. If I say, well, that's why we have the senior tax program, they say, well, yes, but those benefits are so meager. Uh, finally, uh, there's an optional senior tax credit program that hasn't been mentioned this morning that allows taxpayers to defer 100% of their taxes, uh, works like a reverse mortgage. Uh, I'm told that, an, that uh, few, if any, uh, qualifying seniors opt for that program, even though it would give them a much larger benefit. Uh, and uh, some of the reasons I've, been, I've heard for why nobody opts for that program don't sound uh, rational to me, but, but I would suggest a different optional program uh, in which a qualifying senior would get, say, double the benefit that this current program offers uh, in the first year, but then a smaller benefit in each subsequent qualifying year uh, so that it basically phases out over 10 years. And the goal of that, I, the op of that uh, suggested optional program is to is to nudge seniors uh, out of their family homes into an apartment or a senior residence. Uh, and as you've heard me say, I believe, uh, the state is projecting that the population of Greenwich is going to decline by 20% uh, by 2040, primarily due to aging and shrinking households. 
but our goal is to have a vibrant town. We need to free up some of these family homes to attract new families to Greenwich. So in summary, I support the senior tax credit, but urge you to make it more generous. Uh, the budget was a million dollars when I was on the BET in 2004. Um, it, uh, last year it was 950,000 and this year it was only 900,000 and the reason for the reducing budget is because so few pe so few seniors are qualifying for this program and I would suggest that the reason that so few seniors are qualifying is that no is that there is that few so few seniors have such low incomes that they can even qualify uh, and uh, and I uh, further suggest an optional program that offers a more generous benefit, but that would that starts higher and nudges seniors out of their family homes. Uh, and and I would uh, uh, recommend that we keep the five-year sunset because uh, because we need we need to know why so few seniors are qualifying for this program. The number went from 653 in 2013. 595 in 2015 and only 563 this past year. So th there's something there's something awry with this program and I think we need to understand it better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Lauren, can you you could just speak to the fact that while it's while it's set for a five year, 10 year, you provide pu public updates to the BET on this annually though. Right, I have to budget in the local ordinance, um, I, I have to budget exactly how much tax credits we're going to give on the local level. If by chance I get too many applicants and I exceed that level, I, I'm not allowed to exceed that level without either a, the BET granting me more uh, revenue or I have to then redisperse the credits to oh. the seniors. We've never, since I've been here, we haven't hit that number, but we've come close. But uh, speaking to, sorry. No, I don't think, I think it was just feedback. Um, so I think part of the issue here is that we have, we don't have, uh, and it's hard to say exactly how many seniors are out there that actually don't get that. That's the number and that's the question that we don't know. If you actually get both the state and the local, uh, the local program, you can get up to $3,600 in tax relief. Um, I don't know based upon if that's an appropriate number or not, um, but I do know for a fact that we do not have, we have not had any, any seniors apply for the tax deferral uh, portion of this. And I think part of that is, is that the local option gives you a similar, gr gives you a similar reduction. You don't have to put a lien against your property and you don't have to repay that back. So I think that's really the reason why mo most people opt for this local versus the tax do you have any thought based upon what you're seeing in values that this program be could become more widely dependent upon if there's a shift in terms of who's paying as a result of the 2020 reval I would imagine that it would not, um, a, a, as property values on the, basically this is the lower end of, of the spectrum in our house values. Remember, you're talking about assessed value, so if you have assessed value of a million three, you're basically talking to someone who has a two, you know, up to a two million dollar value on their home, fair market value on their home. Um, I would imagine that, um, mm -hmm that there might be a little bit of a, of, of a um, I'm allowed to adjust that every year. I don't foresee that being the problem as the assessment limit so much as if you wanted to include more people, I believe that um, it would be the income loads that would have to be exp ex expanded. And um, it's hard to say because the way the ordinance is written, the assessment ceiling, so to speak, is based upon sales that occurred that prior year. So. I can't tell you 
what's going to happen. I don't, I don't honestly know. I don't know what's going to happen in the, in the real estate market. So if values continue to go up, will that take, that will actually help people. If, if values come down, that will actually limit the people, if you follow what I'm saying. Yeah, no, no, that's what I'm trying to get my head around. But in terms of, I think, Mr. Litvak touched on the area that it would, and you just re reaffirmed it, it would be to adjust those income levels to have the direct I think that would have the most impact on if you if if the ultimate result is to get as many seniors on this program, um, is to I increase the income limits a bit more. Yeah, I mean it, it's the money doesn't go as far. The cost of living here is higher, so the the money doesn't go as far. So that would be a reason for increasing. And just for a frame of reference, if, um, if an older adult saved, um, say, $3,500 a year, the cost of Medicare Part B premium, the cost of their Part D drug premium, the cost of medications, um, their supplemental insurance coverage would exceed that 3500 credit. So we know that the trend is to help older adults age in place. And that means to age with whether it's in the home that they've raised their children in or the community that they've resided in. And that's what the trend is. And as an age-friendly community, that's what we're advocating for. Um, to the extent that perhaps there could be more refinement on um, the, the grid itself, um, the, the upward level in terms of the maximum threshold, and whatnot, then obviously that's up for more discussion. But in terms of what we're trying to accomplish, and through the Commission on Aging as well as the Department of Human Services, we are on the front lines of dealing directly with individuals that do have constrained incomes, that have to decide whether or not they'll renew a medication because it's too costly, uh, they might split their dose, and so it, it, it truly is a real issue that we face. Okay. And if we go back to those, uh, the data that United Way provided us with 27% of the town of Greenwich uh, residents um, being income constrained, and again, that's not stratified for age, um, we know that we have some real issues here um, that we're hoping to address. So I'll, I'll defer to you and to your Well, I, I support what Sandy is saying. I think. And I don't want to I don't want to take away from the work that you do because you do your committee does excellent work but in terms of having something we could sink our teeth into as it relates to how they arrived at those particular um, income thresholds th again with the again anecdotally just saying this but you're you gave it some context with the prescription why it's 60 or 66 or 66 why isn't it 76 right. and if we were to raise it to 76 how many more people potentially do we bring into the program why don't we don't know but I guess in absence of not knowing it'd be worthwhile to see some attempt made through existing data sources to try to peg that that area to know would we pick up a couple hundred and I think commensurate to this is you're doing the notification and thank you to the tax collector I think that's going to help too because a lot of people may be unaware of it so I mean this will get to every uh, taxpayer in the town correct and we're not doing that now so um, if we're if the numbers don't go up in spite of the fact that we're putting it out in every tax bill um, then, uh, then we can evaluate, uh, you know, the effectiveness of that. Um, and we just stuck with the 66,000 threshold. Um, we weren't looking to expand that, and that's why, you know, the grid was just modified within that. Um, I know that you're on a timetable um, to go to RTM and BET, but if we were to not act on this today, with the only reason not acting would be to see if we could address that particular area of expansion will that present a problem for you I mean I imagine it's going to come up at the other locations I just think as the executive board for the town we'd like to be proactive in 
in affirming, at least I don't want to speak for Mr. Toner, but I think, uh, Sandy, I'm speaking for you as well because you already articulated. But I agree, we should see if we could get better data to tell us how we could impact and provide benefit to a broader number of seniors if we were to raise those thresholds. You, you are uh, accurately repeating, you know, my view, and uh, I was going to ask the question that you've now asked. Can we take a little time to uh, put this off and, and try to get data which will inform us a little more about what we can do to help? Yep, okay. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Um, Richmond and Mrs. Burns both want to comment, so let's. I, I just want to say to be, to be official, <clears throat> um, the tax bills are going out today. So the notification is already on the tax bill. So can you maybe separate out and give an approval for the tax bills to go sure, out? Sure, sure. I mean, in all candor, though, I don't think you need our approval to do that because you're independently elected right, and you okay. get to do, Just make believe sure. it or not, you get to make that decision all by yourself. <laughs> but we enjoy. Don't, don't tell them that, Peter. Don't tell them that, <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, if I, I don't think anybody here doesn't endorse it, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's tremendous to use that mailing to communicate whatever information the town needs to. I, I would love to put in a, th a little uh, information on what rights of way, like we've done this in the past, but people don't understand the whole right of way from a public road and their responsibility. Are, that's another one, Howard, that you could take up in the future. You make. You make a lot of friends. Um, so, so, oh, we've got someone waiting. I'm sorry. So, um, is there a problem with just waiting? With the understanding, waiting only because we'd like to see potential expansion. I don't think there's any doubt the board endorses the program. And frankly, we could we could move today to forward it on. But I think sincerely, we have a interest in knowing how we could further impact um, and help by <coughs> increasing the income um, eligibility threshold. No, it's, it's no problem whatsoever. And um, we want to present to you the most refined um, version of what we're proposing. So absolutely. OK. Great. So that's, I, say, I think that's the focus, correct? Absolutely. Okay, okay super. And again, I want to thank um, Mrs. Burns, Chairman Burns, and um, Mr. Berg. Thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you all. Yeah. So we've got someone waiting to be interviewed for um, one of our boards. Lori? I, I need a motion to. Lori? Oh, excuse us one second, one part. Do you want to return us to return these documents to you that have that information so there's no doubt? Yeah. We did anything nefarious. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'd like to okay. Shredder. Is it just, it's these two pieces? Yes. All right, wait a second. And so there's three copies from the selectmen. Perfect. Four. And Thank Ms. you. Thank you so Thanks. much for your time. And uh, happy holiday. Yeah. Enjoy it. Well. Okay, so we need a motion to go into executive session for purposes of interviewing candidates for boards and commissions, and I gather to and discuss also. pending uh, litigation, litigation and settlement of claim. So, so moved. Okay, without objection, 1142. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, this is a resumption of the regularly scheduled Board of Selectmen meeting, uh, second one of the month of is December. Did I believe yes. he did. Okay. Um, under under um, executive session, we heard uh, two matters of real estate property assessment appeals, and we also um, interviewed candidate for nomination of Board of Commission. At this time, um, under new business are the items that we heard about, so I'd entertain a motion. Ms. Hines, if you'd be so kind to read the... Do we have a motion to go out of executive session? 
All right, let's, okay, Second. 1234. Okay, so um, on our agenda, we had a request to settle Tiffany Properties and Management, Inc. versus Town of Greenwich. Um, this is a property located at 195 Field Point Road, uh, docket number uh, HHB CV 16-603-6221S, parcel number 01-1697-S. Um, this settlement is favorable to the town. Uh, there will be no refund of taxes as a result of the reduction in assessment. And it will be taken as a credit of approximately $13,305 against future tax payments. If the plaintiff were to prevail at trial based upon its appraisal, it would be entitled to a cash refund of approximately $25,816 plus interest and costs. Is there a motion to approve? So been moved. Is there a second? Okay. Without objection. Second. Barbara's thunder away from her. Well, I'm just giving her a chance to get going. Okay, Barbara, you could take the second one. Okay. Becker versus the town of Greenwich, docket number FST, CD 17-501668-2S, parcel number 09-2445-S. And this is for a tax credit of approximately $754 against future tax payments. If the plaintiffs were to have prevailed at trial, based upon their appraisal, they would have been entitled to a cash refund of approximately $3,402 plus interest and costs. Okay, is there a motion? It's been moved. Okay, without objection, that completes those two items. As we move to um, nominations um, there are a couple that we're going to undertake today um, the first um, I'd like to move uh, in the area of human services uh, and this is for a position that will become vacant uh, in June of 2019 uh, which we are aware of um, I'd like to move the nomination of Thomas Patron um, to serve as a regular member of the Board of Human Services for a term expiring 6 30 20 22. Okay, it's been seconded. Discussion. Um, i just like to uh, mention Mr. Patron came before us, um, expressed a sincere interest in giving back to the community, which he's been a resident of for a number of years. Um, he has a uh, impressive background uh, in business and finance. Uh, I believe the Board of Human Services would benefit greatly from his expertise in assessing the programs that it funds, both um, externally through outside agencies and then looking at its overall um, internal operations. Um, his skill set is one that is not presently on the board, and I think uh, in speaking with Commissioner uh, Barry and having Mr. Patron speak with uh, Commissioner Barry, both agree he would provide great benefit to not only that board but the town at large. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, it's been seconded. Uh, any, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, for the Board of Health, there are um, there is a vacancy due to the result of a relocation of a board member, and uh, at this time I'd entertain a nomination. I'd like to <coughs> nominate Lauren O'Keefe, and I don't have the details of the term. Okay, and that would be for a term that would expire on June 30th, 2020. Uh, the, the motion has been made by Mr. Toner to nominate Lauren O'Keefe. And Sandy seconded. And it was seconded by Mr. Litvak. Discussion? Uh, we know that um, Mrs. O'Keefe uh, grew up in town. She is a APRN, um, been a member of the Board of Health Medical Reserve Corps and desires to continue to uh, serve the town 
in the medical sphere. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. And then finally, um, this board has uh, diligently and conscientiously worked to uh, meet with as many interested citizens as possible to fill a vacancy in the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, this regular position uh, was held by Richard Maitland. Um, we interviewed a number of outside candidates uh, for the regular position as well as interviewing all three of the alternates. And um, at this time, I would entertain a motion to um, make a nomination. Uh, David Hartman. Okay, Mr. Um, Toner is placing in nomination the name of um, David Hartman. It's Edwin Dave. Legally known as um, Edwin D. Hardman Jr., but goes by Dave. Uh, he is a resident of 46 Corriglia Drive in Riverside. He's been a resident of Greenwich since 1995. Uh, he has been a director of the Riverside Association. Um, he's had a 39 year career in real estate investment and nonprofit organization dealing with complex matters. Um, he is presently a alternate member of the commission and expressed a sincere desire to um, fill the role and believes his uh, position right now in his life he affords him the opportunity to do so. Um, by way of education background, he has um, an MBA from Harvard Business School. He attended the United States Military Academy uh, he had been employed um, as a managing director at Warburg Pincus uh, in the private equity and global real estate investing. And he's been involved uh, with our schools as a major supporter of our water polo team um, and with the Shoreham Club in Old Greenwich, as well as a coach for the OGRCC. Um, and again, a very bright, thoughtful, and objective person. And um, he was seconded, right? Yes. Sandy seconded? Yes. Yeah, I, okay. Not, I do. Okay. So is there further discussion? I, I just gave a bit of a profile, but does anyone else like to add? Any comments no, about? I think, you, I think you summarized it. He is an outstanding candidate. He obviously has. Uh, been on the uh, commission as an alternate for the past nine months, and I think uh, he's a perfect one to move up to fill the vacancy. Great, thank you. So, all in favor of Dave Hardman uh, Jr. for the regular position on planning and zoning, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, three zero zero. Um, we again thank all those. We do have. Um, we do have other positions to fill in the coming months, so those whose names have come forward, um, we will be giving due consideration and there will be opportunity to um, uh, serve. I believe that concludes the business before uh, this board today. I wanna wish my two colleagues the uh, very best for a happy holiday and a healthy, happy new year to each of them and their families. And it's been a real pleasure serving alongside both of them over this past year. And again, I look forward to a very uh, productive next year. Amen. I wish you, Peter and John, exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, a happy and a healthy new year, a Merry Christmas. And uh, yeah, it should be a good year next year for all of us, I hope. Yes, thank you so much. Safe home, Sandy. We'll try. I'll get to see you guys before terribly long. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll try to keep things in order here. It's a perfect segue to the next just, meeting. You, 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 just, you just have to keep in order until it's good tomorrow. I'll be back. <laughs> okay. Our <laughs> next board meeting is Thank when? Guys. Thursday, January 10th, and I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Move to adjourn. All right. Thank you.